Hey, greetings and welcome. We are going to discuss Chapter 6 today in the Arnheim Apprentice book, uh, Environmental Considerations. So today our, our focus is going to be primarily on heat illnesses, but we'll also look at some other things that are pertinent to the athletic trainer, uh, whether it be rain, lightning, um, various other conditions that, that uh, could potentially impact participation. So let's get started. Okay, so first thing we're going to look at is hyperthermia, which hyper means above, thermia, temperature. So basically all of our heat illness, illnesses would fall under that category. Hypothermia, which here in West Texas we don't deal with as often, but certainly uh, a number of our sports teams here at Texas Tech travel to uh, areas of the country that get very cold, and, and frankly it does get cold here as well, so just because it doesn't happen where we live very often doesn't mean we shouldn't learn about it. Uh, we'll also go over altitude sickness, uh, uh, sun exposure issues, and lightning concerns, as well as air pollution. Um, one other one that we'll take a look at is circadian dysrhythmia, which is uh, jet lag most commonly called, and then synthetic turf, uh, just some considerations here for us to uh, to look at. All right, so let's start with hyperthermia. Uh, this is a condition where the body temperature is elevated. This can show itself in many different ways, depending on the athlete, depending on their hydration status, depending on their conditioning level, depending on their body composition so there's really no way of predicting how an athlete's going to respond so heat stress we're all exposed to heat stress uh, excessive levels of heat stress however are preventable so uh, things like frequent hydration shade breaks water breaks those kinds of things are critically important the hotter it is the higher the heat index the more important it, it becomes so when the body's ability to dissipate heat becomes impaired, that's when heat illness becomes more likely. Okay, so this likelihood is increased when we exercise in excessive heat, and it's not a huge problem here, but excessive humidity. Um, those of you more from the uh, the coastal regions, uh, even the Midwest, where humidity is frequently very high, that heat index can be quite a bit uh, hotter. Okay. So there are a number of things that influence heat, uh, the acquisition or the loss of heat. Uh, the first is metabolic heat production. That's the result of normal body processes. Uh, we know that individuals who are obese uh, tend to retain more of that body heat because body fat is an insulator. Athletes who are very lean don't tend to retain heat, but we also know that body fat is uh, largely water. So lean individuals don't have that big reservoir uh, of added water. So electrolyte imbalances become their problem. Uh, conduction results in heat loss through direct contact and we see this often in artificial turf which we'll talk about some other concerns with it later. But uh, it's not uncommon to set foot on artificial turf and you can actually feel that heat in your shoes. Convection, on the other hand, is a heat transfer through the air or through fluid. So when we use a hot or cold whirlpool, we're actually using convection there. Uh, radiation is heat transfer through empty space. Um, and the reason for this picture here, uh, this one's a couple years old when Oregon was one of the only schools that did it. Now almost everybody does it. Texas Tech certainly does it as well. But jersey color plays a huge role. In, in heat retention. So the all black uniform you see here, uh, you know, even on the same team, uh, that, that uniform is going to retain more heat than say this gray and white uniform or even the green and white uniform. Our body's primary mechanism for losing heat is through evaporation. And that's why we sweat. We sweat brings water, brings fluid to the surface and when it evaporates it converts from a fluid to a gas and as it gases off it takes heat with it. Now unfortunately that doesn't work very well when it's really humid and the ambient air is already relatively 
heavily saturated with water. So instead of sweat evaporating away, it drips off, and that's not nearly as efficient of a mechanism of uh, reducing body temperature. So to prevent heat illness, there are several things we can do. The first is to hydrate um, before practice, during practice, after practice. Um, the NATA, National Athletic Trainers Association, has published a fluid replacement guidelines chart, uh, or, or a, actually it's not a chart, but rather a position stand, and it uh, has created guidelines through which we want athletes to follow uh, in order to make sure they're adequately hydrated. So before practice, they should drink uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 12 to 20 ounces of fluid up to 15 minutes before activity and then during activity another cup or so every 20 minutes or so and then we also want to hydrate after practice uh, your textbook will outline those specific details for you it's probably a good idea to take a look at them but this hydration process uh, we've seen these products from Gatorade um, normal cool water is fine we don't have to have special electrolyte beverages or recovery drinks or uh, pre-workout, pre-game fuels. Um, those are probably important for someone like an endurance cyclist or marathoner where their activity is going to result in a loss of electrolytes, going to res result in uh, a relative depletion of muscular glycogen. But for most athletes, water's just fine. The benefit of using something like a Gatorade or a Powerade is that it's flavored and the athletes are more likely to consume more of it. So uh, that's the reason why we'll provide Gatorade and water during practice. It's, it's not so much that they need the electrolyte or the carbohydrate. It's that uh, because of the taste and the flavor, they're more likely to consume more fluid. Now, acclimatization is another way we can prevent heat illness, and this basically just means we're not going to throw that athlete straight from the couch into aggressive, regular practices. Um, so the uh, NCAA, as well as UIL, have worked to change this over the years. Um, there was a time when preseason pre football practice, uh, teams would practice two and even three times a day. Uh, two days have effectively been mandated out of existence uh, and, and that is an attempt to assist with this acclimatization process and to keep athletes uh, more uh, resistant to fatigue make sure that they maintain proper uh, hydration levels and just overall ensure their safety we also want to identify our prime suspects uh, as we said our particularly lean athletes are prone to cramping are particularly heavy athletes who have a high percent body fat are particularly prone to heat exhaustion so um, we want to identify them and keep a close eye on them uniform selection we've already kind of talked about how the darker colors uh, retain heat so lighter colors wicking fabrics fewer layers all those things are important weight charts are also important because uh, that helps us monitor uh, how much fluid athletes are losing. Uh, monitoring that heat index helps us ensure that we're practicing safely. And then urine color and output also tells us uh, how hydrated the patient is or the athlete is. So for hydration, we said cool water is, is best. If we've got an athlete who is starting to show signs of uh, electrolyte imbalances they start cramping um, you see them kind of pulling themselves out and kind of stretching after every rep or every drill uh, several different things that we use for that uh, one that I've used for years is called phosphory this is a high calcium and iron supplement it comes in a big yellow horse pill it's relatively fast acting so if we uh, want to use this on an athlete who's starting to experience these symptoms usually this will help them pretty quickly uh, if we have an athlete that we know is prone to cramping then uh, what I'll typically use is a product called heat guard and this is what's called a slow salt and this they can take this before practice it will release slowly over the next several hours it's primarily potassium in, in uh, composition and uh, 
you can sometimes combine these. Give them a, a, a heat guard and a phosphory so they get a slow release as well as kind of a quick uh, acting supplement and then if they need additional electrolyte we can either give them phosphory or what we use a lot in athletic training are called gator lights. These are little packets of electrolyte designed to be dumped into a 20 ounce Gatorade. Shake it up. It'll taste a little salty. It's not as sweet and as as uh, as good, frankly. A lot of times the athletes will say, you know, it tastes kind of like seawater, but that additional electrolyte content can help prevent or treat cramps. Some other things that have been used for years in athletics, Pedialyte and Medilite are uh, intended for infants who have diarrhea or otherwise uh, not able to uh, keep fluid in and uh, you know they're, they can be expensive uh, some of these are shipped in glass bottles which don't travel well uh, we'll have trouble if, if we're trying to carry that in our our carry-on um, so uh, well, a fluid of any sort actually these days but either way a glass bottle is not terribly practical for for athletic training I've had these uh, break in the travel trunk before and it got everywhere created a mess so definitely like the plastic bottles Elite Sport is a concentrate of electrolyte and we can add this just like we can add uh, Gator Light to uh, a sports beverage and it does make it taste a little saltier but uh, it will help prevent cramping. Now a lot of times students ask where do I buy Gator Light? Uh, you really can't. As a as a consumer you can't buy this. Uh, Gatorade makes this available to their Gatorade schools and they provide it for you for free. Basically for every bottle of Gatorade you purchase for your athletic teams they will give you a packet of Gator Light. Um, an alternative for average consumer is the Gatorade Endurance Formula. It's not quite as much electrolyte as we get if we put this in a standard 20 ounce Gatorade, but it's higher. It doesn't taste as good, but if you know, you're know you training for marathon or uh, triathlon or something like that and, and you're having trouble cramping, uh, that might be the way to go. Now we know that dehydration occurs when as little as 2% of our body weight is lost in fluid. So this is why we do pre and post practice uh, weigh-ins, weigh-outs, because we know that body composition isn't changing during that time. That's all water weight. Um, this loss can impair cardiovascular function because we're essentially making the, the blood component more viscous. It's less watery. It's harder to push through the peripheral circulation. It also will impair the thermoregulatory responses. It's harder for your body to make sweat if you're dehydrated. Um, signs and symptoms of dehydration by the time we're thirsty we're already dehydrated as the symptoms increase dizziness dry mouth irritability fatigue possible cramps um, when we start to see these things we need to move that individual to a cool environment and start rehydrating them now I kind of alluded to these earlier the NATA fluid replacement guidelines uh, as we said seven uh, I said 12 to 20, 17 to 20 ounces, two to three hours before. Uh, so you know, a bottle of Gatorade or a, you know a 12 ounce bottle, add a little bit more to it, and that's where I got the 12. Is uh, you know your water bottles that you buy at the, the gas station are oftentimes uh, 12 ounce bottles. Uh, it's also important to kind of preload um, a, a little bit closer before. Okay, so another cup of water, 7 to 10 ounces is basically like a paper cup, uh, uh, Dixie cup size, uh, Im immediately or close to immediately before, 10 to 20 minutes. So usually in a practice situation we'll have a water station set up and the athletes are encouraged to drink uh, before the warm-up begins. And then protocol is basically a cup of water every 10 to 20 minutes, um, 7 to 10 ounces, I think I said 12 ounces again, but uh, the NATA guidelines are 7 to 10. Um, if they can drink more than that without getting sick to their stomach, then that's fine. Uh, so uh, that may be uh, something that your athlete considers. If, if, if they're having these amounts in 
this frequency and they're still having trouble, it might be worthwhile to try to push a little bit more fluid and see if they can handle it without getting queasy and sick to their stomach. Um, as long as the activity is less than an hour in duration, then there's really no scientific evidence that says sports drinks are needed. Uh, they may be preferred in terms of flavor. The important part here is the carbohydrate concentration needs to be 6%. Uh, if it's less than 6%, then there's really no benefit. If it's more than 6%, your body starts to treat it like a food and it has to be digested. It's, it's not as readily absorbed. So uh, that slows absorption. So the 6% number seems to be kind of a magic window. Uh, also, a little bit of sodium. That's electrolyte we're looking for. So 0 0.3 to 0 0.7 grams per liter of sodium. And if you look at Gatorade, it's right in this range. Uh, Powerade is actually a little bit sweeter. Its carbohydrate concentration by volume is closer to 7%. So uh, some people like that taste better, but whatever. Okay. Um, acclimatization has has uh, has changed, and th this was the NCAA policy uh, as recent as last season, and um, they uh, previously only allowed one practice per day, three hours maximum, and there were equipment restrictions, helmets and shorts, um, helmets and what we call shells, basically we talked about shells during the, or we'll talk about, you haven't had that lesson yet, I've already recorded it, but uh, it's basically like a, an under pad that, that they wear, and then by the fifth day, full pads. And, and here's the change, is uh, as of 2017, these two practices per day every other day have been outlawed. This this doesn't happen anymore because even this acclimatization policy was found to be too risky. Um, and part of the reason we've seen this change is that 20 years ago, athletes would show up to campus and they needed to get into shape. Uh, it was more difficult for them because they're, they're trying to get into condition and they're trying to get ready for the season all at once. And anymore, uh, off-season and preseason conditioning programs, it's pretty much just assumed that when practice begins, you're in condition. We're not trying to, to train you to be in shape for games. Uh, it's, it's basically time to practice. Uh, but acclimatization in general is a progressive exposure. So honestly, the old NCAA policy kind of showed this progressive policy a little bit better than the new one. Um, the thinking here is that the athlete should already be acclimatized to, this, to, the, to the environment, but we don't want to overexpose them with allowing multiple practices. So our prime suspects, are, uh, lots of times in football at least, are really lean players, defensive backs, uh, your running backs, your wide receivers. Um, muscular and lean, they'll be your crampers. Your overweight or obese players, uh, they tend to have uh, problems with heat retention. Okay, so um, other prime suspects, you're very young, you're very old, uh, just in the general population. So when we reach those kind of dog days of summer in uh, mid-August, then uh, that's when we see problems here because the thermoregulatory systems on both the very young and the very old aren't as efficient as uh, adults. Also, anybody that has had a history of heat illness, if they've had heat stroke, then they are at risk for heat illness for the rest of their life. So that's something else to consider during the pre-participation physical. Uniform selection, uh, light colored, lightweight, wicking material like a, an Under Armour or dry fit is going to be preferred. Um, the lighter colors are going to be better. You might not have much say in that. When I was at Arizona, we're in Tucson, it would be 110, 112 degrees, hardly any humidity, but still hot. Uh, our offense would wear white and our defense would wear blue, navy blue, dark blue, and uh, we would consistently see that our defensive players tended to have problems more readily than our offensive players did, just something as simple as jersey selection. Uh, net jerseys that are breathable are okay. Um, something like this. Uh, people use these for cutting weight. 
so-called sauna suits, like a plastic that retains body heat and retains sweat. Um, we want to avoid these because those are going to increase the risk for heat illness. Weight charts, we have the athlete weigh in before practice starts. We have the athlete weigh out after practice is over. Let's do the simple math, calculate the difference. If it's greater than 2% of their body weight that's lost, then we should hold them out until that returns within range. We also want to monitor this over time. Um, it's really important that your coaching staff is on board with this. If the athletes aren't forced to do this, oftentimes they won't. When I was with the Raiders, uh, they would be fined 100 bucks for every way in or way out that they missed. So everybody, you know, even though these guys are millionaires, they're still cheapskates. Uh, they didn't want to be fined, so they would be sure to step on the scale before and after practice. Um, electronic systems can ease this process, but uh, just having a a simple Excel spreadsheet printed out that somebody can record weight on is good. It's a good idea to have someone actually do this, a third party, a student or uh, a certified. Um, we don't want to rely on the athletes to do this themselves to make sure they're not hiding something. Okay, monitoring the heat index. Um, this is going to be uh, important. It, it's not just what the temperature is, but it's how that temperature feels okay so heat index charts like this so for instance if it's 100 degrees outside and it's 40 percent humidity it feels like 109 if it's uh, 88 degrees but 95 percent relative humidity it's 100 it feels like 117 so even though the temperature is a lot lower because of that high humidity it feels hotter it's more difficult for our body to deal with that temperature. So there are a couple of ways we can monitor this. One is a sling psychrometer. Um, this is basically a regular mercury thermometer and then another mercury thermometer that has a little wick over it that uh, we put water in the end here. So this is called a dry bulb and this is called a wet bulb and this allows us to basically calculate what that heat index is. And the reason we do this is instead of just using like the National Weather Service or you know our Weatherbug app on our phone, is because we're not as concerned about what temperature is in town. We want to know what it is right where we are. And I'll give you an example of this. Like I said, in Arizona, very dry. It it might be 10% humidity, but our practice field was natural grass and it was irrigated. Okay, so. Uh, if we happen to have practice right after they had watered the field, it might be 60 or 70 percent relative humidity. You can feel the steam rising off of that practice field, even though the regular ambient uh, relative humidity was 10 or 15 percent. Okay, so it's site specific. Uh, it's not just uh, what is the general temperature and and uh, humidity in town. Another alternative is a digital psychrometer. So you can see here it tells you 13% relative humidity. Uh, it's telling what the uh, dry bulb and wet bulb temperatures are and it's calculating that that humidity for us. It's important to have these posted uh, over urinals and on the backs of bathroom stalls so that athletes can monitor their urine color. Basically, if they're anything 4 through 8, they're dehydrated. That yellow color, the darker color, means that the waste product in their urine is more concentrated. Uh, if it's lighter, straw-colored, or clear, then that tells us it's relatively dilute and they're adequately hydrated. Okay, So uh, we look at urine output, which we don't necessarily measure that in most cases, but we'll ask them, you know, when was the last time you went? And then we'll ask them to point to what color their urine was. Now, I say here, beware of supplements. That can totally throw a wrench in the color. Urine may be green, it may be orange, it, it may really throw things off. So, uh, if you've got an athlete who claims to be one of these darker colors, then you might also want to ask them if they're taking any kind of supplement. All right, the types of heat illness that uh, we're going to talk about are uh, listed here. Uh, they're not necessarily listed in 
in uh, simplest to worst, but somewhat. Okay, um, the more serious conditions are listed here at the bottom. So we'll we'll take these one at a time. Uh, heat rash is a skin condition, sometimes called prickly heat. We get these raised red bumps, and this is usually in response to continual heat and dampness. Um, lots of times athletes will get these in the groin or in areas of the skin where the skin lays on itself in the uh, folds of the elbows and the backs of the knees. Um, and the hardest thing here is keeping these areas dry. So uh, it's important to teach the athlete appropriate hygiene, make sure you dry off adequately after showers, maybe even use a blow dryer to to ensure that those areas are uh, good and dry before you put clothing on because even if they think they're dry and they're still a little damp and they put clothing over the top of that then the clothing will be damp and now we've got wet cloth laying or wet material of some sort laying on there. Um, they can use things like powders, various drying agents, uniform changes um, We've had athletes who would they would change their undershirt at halftime or they would change it midway through practice just to minimize the risk of this because this can become an infection risk uh, if the skin breaks. Uh, now it's more serious than just uh, they've got an itchy rash. Now they've got an opportunity for infection. So uh, in this day and age, that's even more important than ever because of the risk of staph infections. Heat syncope, sometimes called heat collapse. This usually results from standing in the heat uh, and this is unacclimatized individuals. Uh, I've dealt with this several times at track meets where we've got officials who are uh, quite a bit older. They're untrained. They're not used to being out in the heat. Uh, this one we treat pretty easily by cooling and replacing fluids. Heat cramps, deal with this one all the time. This is a hydration problem with a loss of electrolytes. Uh, those electrolytes can include sodium, calcium, potassium, uh, I'm sorry, sodium chloride, potassium, magnesium, and calcium. Uh, our most likely crampers are in good shape. They tend to be really lean. Uh, these folks will present with profuse sweating, very painful cramps and spasm because they have electrolyte balances. So what's happened here is they've lost so much fluid that the environment around their muscle tissue resembles that that they have when they're trying to voluntarily contract. So they end up with these involuntary contractions. Uh, I see all too often people will try to stretch these, they'll, they'll do massage, they're, they're trying to treat the symptoms but they're not trying to treat the source. So the key here is getting them electrolyte and getting them fluid. Uh, we want to treat this with water, Gatorade, ice massage for the thermal benefits. Um, if this lasts more than for probably 10 minutes then an IV is, is probably going to be your, your fastest way to uh, get these alleviated. Heat exhaustion, on the other hand, instead of heat cramps, where we see this in our conditioned athletes, heat exhaustion we see in our poorly conditioned athletes. This is a hydration problem that impacts cardiac output. So they're usually profusely sweating, their skin is red and flushed because their body has tried to vasodilate to radiate heat out of the core. Um, they may be disoriented, their body temp may be slightly elevated but their pulse is still strong and rapid and that's a critical distinction between heat exhaustion and uh, heat stroke where their pulse is not necessarily strong and rapid. We're going to treat this with uh, IV fluids. Um, it's important for a healthcare professional to get a rectal temp to make sure their core temp is not elevated uh, beyond safe levels. Uh, remove soaked clothing, get them cooled down as quickly as we can because this can turn into heat stroke if we're not careful. Now, heat stroke can occur from heat exhaustion if we leave it untreated or it can just occur suddenly. It, it may occur without warning. This is a serious life-threatening emergency. Basically the thermoregulatory system completely shuts down. Um, the core temp is 106 or higher, which at this point we're losing brain cells every moment that we are at that elevated temperature. Shallow breathing and a rapid pulse, trying to blow off heat. Um, they are 
no longer actively sweating. They may be wet, but if we dry them off, we see they're not still sweating. So that's a critical sign. Uh, we want to treat this as rapidly as possible. This is an activate EMS right away. Treat this as a medical emergency. Um, many places they will have a cold tub available for immediate immersion to try to cool that athlete as rapidly as possible. Malignant hyperthermia is a muscle disorder where we get hypersensitivity to anesthesia and to heat. And this may give us similar signs and symptoms to heat stroke. In order to get a definitive diagnosis, we need a biopsy. Lots of times the athlete will complain of muscle pain following exercise, um, and their temperature stays elevated for quite a while after exercise when they ordinarily would start to return to normal. Um, Athletes with this condition uh, should be disqualified from participation in hot, humid, you know, high heat stress type environments. Rhabdomyolysis, sometimes just called rhabdo, is a sudden destruction of skeletal muscle in response to heat stress. So we end up with heavy load of basically the waste products. What's left from that skeletal muscle destruction, that protein, ends up in the vascular system and then it has to be filtered out by the kidneys. So a lot of times the athlete will describe severe muscular weakness, swelling and pain. Uh, they may have acute compartment syndrome. They're going to have tenderness. They'll have this dark Coca-Cola colored urine uh, because it's basically full of the uh, remnants of, of destroyed muscle cells. Uh, the risk is greater in those with sickle cell trait. We know that's more common in our African-American population, uh, but it's not necessarily uh, isolated exclusively to that group. Hyponatremia is kind of the opposite end of the spectrum where uh, the athlete is essentially overhydrated. Hypo means below. Natremia refers to sodium in a sodium. Uh, this is sometimes called water intoxication. Uh, this is actually caused by athletes who drink too much water during activity. Their fluid intake is greater than the fluid they lose. And where we probably first saw this was uh, kind of novice runners who take water at every hydration station along the route. Uh, those aren't there because you need water that frequently. They're there because athletes have needs at different rates. So uh, it's important to remember that. Uh, these are electrolyte beans, uh, little jelly beans that have electrolyte in them. Uh, these can help kind of stave this off. Uh, the symptoms, headache, vomiting, swelling in the extremities. Um, if this is severe, this can be treated pretty readily with intravenous sodium, uh, diuretics that will help reduce fluid volume, uh, or other uh, high concentration fluids other than water. All right, so that leads us to hypothermia, hypo meaning below, like a hypodermic needle goes below the skin. Um, this is where temperatures are lower than normal. So anywhere we've got a cold environment, and just like with heat index, we talked about uh, elevated temperature plus humidity. Well, with wind chill, we talk about decreased temperature and high wind speed, making it feel colder than the temperature gauge would actually lead us to believe. You throw in dampness with that and it's worse even still. Um, prevention of hypothermia is pretty simple. Uh, layered clothing, keeping dry, avoiding fatigue, and interestingly enough, proper hydration. And that's one that a lot of people don't recall. And the reason for that is our body's thermal regulatory system depends on uh, fluid movement and being able to uh, ensure adequate fluid movement depends on proper hydration. So if we're dehydrated, then that doesn't work. Um, where I grew up in the Midwest, lots of my friends were deer hunters, and deer hunters are kind of notorious for uh, getting up early in the morning, getting up in a tree in, the, in uh, late November, somewhere around Thanksgiving time, and uh, hypothermia issues are common hot cocoa and these other types of warm beverages might be helpful uh, but certainly no alcohol especially if you're a hunter that goes without saying but uh, things that are going to 
B diuretics are to be avoided. So caffeinated beverages, um, anything that that uh, is going to have uh, a stimulant, an energy drink, or something along those lines, uh, is is going to be contraindicated because it's it's going to cause us to lose more fluid than we take in because of the diuretic properties. We're going to treat hypothermia with uh, gradual warming, rest, and trying to get them dry. The most common cold injuries we face, frost nip, is a relatively minor condition, relatively easily reversed. They may have some blisters and some pain that respond well to compression and rewarming. Frostbite, on the other hand, is where we actually get some tissue loss, most likely. Um, we want to rewarm them a little bit more rapidly because the longer that tissue remains frozen or in that low temperature state, the more likely we're going to have a greater depth of penetration. So uh, much like uh, a surface burn, uh, the, the degree of frostbite depends on how deeply it impacts the tissue. Some other things we can consider. Um, exercise at altitude. Short term is actually not a bad thing. Uh, difficulty breathing. We may have some nausea, vomiting, dizziness. Um, I said that wrong. Long term is actually not a problem. Athletes will go to altitude to train because they want the long term adaptation because the the, the relative percent uh, oxygen in the air is less at altitude. So long term our body will adapt, but short term it is a problem. Um, so nausea, vomiting, dizziness, this may result in uh, problems performing. Acute mountain sickness occurs at heights above 7,000 feet and then at heights above 9,000 feet. Uh, there's the risk of uh, either pulmonary or cerebral edema. Um, these are very serious conditions where we get fluid accumulation uh, either on the lungs or on the brain and uh, you know we don't see these in athletes but we can see these in, in mountain climbers. Okay, some other things to consider. Sun exposure. Um, we want to apply sunscreen early and often. SPF needs to be at least 15. Um, if it's not 30, actually, you're probably wasting your time. Uh, if that's all you have available, then that's okay. But 30 to 40 plus SPF, that sun protection factor is important. Um, don't assume that you don't need it on overclassed, overcast or cloudy days. Uh, UV rays are still there even if we don't get the direct exposure um, to the sunlight. Sweat proof is, is uh, preferred for best results. We want to apply this 15 minutes minimum, 30 minutes before, and then you know we jump in the pool or whatever we need to uh, reapply and uh, uh, ensure that you know, just because we put it on once doesn't mean we're protected for the whole day. Lightning, uh, the old rule of thumb was if we would use what's called the flash to bang method. And, and worst case scenario, you know, you find yourself out in the community and you don't have access to this kind of equipment, then that's better than nothing, but it's still not great. Um, we divide the, the count we get from the flash of lightning to the sound of the thunder, flash to bang. We divide that by five. So if we count to 30 from seeing the flash until we hear the thunder, we divide that by five. What do we end up with here? We end up with six miles of, uh, of that lightning occurrence. Okay. Um, our newer rule of thumb here is that if we see or hear lightning or thunder, we should clear the field. We should seek shelter and then return 30 minutes after the last sight and sound. And the reason we do that is that old rule of thumb of six miles is pretty grossly inadequate. Uh, we know that storm cells have resulted in lightning strikes up to 10 miles away from where they were. Um, if we find ourselves in a situation where we can't get out of that environment and, and there's a storm uh, that we can't get shelter from, 
uh, the best idea here is to crouch, not to lay. Some people think I want to get as low as I can. Well, you're actually maximizing the surface area in contact with the ground. We don't want that. Uh, we would want them to crouch, minimize the amount of surface of, of their body in contact with the ground, and, uh, and, and try to find uh, shelter somewhere, even if it's a ditch or a, a, a ravine or an overpass or something like that. Not in contact with anything metal, if if at all possible. Um, you know, if you're at a baseball field, we want to get away from the backstop for sure. Um, any tall trees, anything like that, would be better. Um, something like this is a very simple lightning detector. National Weather Service has an app or a website available that will allow you to track lightning strikes as well that will give us a little bit more precise info. That leads us to pollutants. Um, here in West Texas we're pretty much talking about dust, but in other parts of the world there are uh, other issues, whether that be industrial pollutants, pollens, things of that nature. Um, this was a big issue when the Olympics were in Beijing. Uh, it was thought to be a pretty dirty city and uh, they actually moved entire, uh, I know of at least one coal-fired power plant that was completely moved for the games. Uh, they shut down traffic and eliminated uh, the amount of motor vehicles that were allowed in the city for several weeks leading up to the games and during. Uh, so uh, that helped kind of avert that problem because there were athletes threatening not to go. Uh, primary pollutants are those that exert their physiological influence directly from the source of their pollutions. For example, carbon monoxide can negatively impact our body's ability to transfer oxygen because oxygen will bind to carbon monoxide uh, readily. Uh, other pollutants like nitrogen oxide, sulfur oxides, um, and general particulate matter. Uh, secondary pollutions interact with primary pollutions uh, in order to, to cause problems for us. So things like ozone, aerosols, uh, those are still problematic even though physiologically they, they aren't necessarily causing the problem directly. Uh, carbon monoxide is the most significant primary pollutant. It does alter the ability of red blood cells to carry oxygen. Um, we can see a negative impact on performance here. So if you're competing or training in an environment with a heavy carbon monoxide level, then that's going to lead to impaired performance at best and serious health consequences at worst, including and leading up to respiratory failure and even death, depending on the, uh, the concentration. Nitrogen dioxide uh, is another kind of combustion uh, pollutant. Um, this gets absorbed by the mucous membrane in the nasopharyngeal cavity, cavity and uh, when this gets inhaled in high concentrations it can lead to problems for years, up to 14 years believe it or not. Uh, and this can lead to diminished exercise tolerance, uh, breathlessness during exertion, so this is no bueno either. Sulfur dioxide um, is a result of burning fossil fuel. So a lot of these we see, you know, these are going to be problematic in heavily populated industrialized areas, uh, in particular in countries where uh, the, the uh, emission standards aren't as stringent as they are here. And we saw problems with this in the 60s and 70s before uh, the United States started to regulate this a little closer. Um, don't necessarily have a huge problem with this in the U.S. now. We've, we've managed to get much of this under control. Fine particulates, this is a West Texas problem. Dust uh, could also include acidic aerosols, tobacco smoke, wood smoke from burning trees, pollens and bacterias from uh, you know, vegetation, and then also the, the burning of sulfur containing fuels. Um, there's no real research that tells us the impact on performance, but it, having lived here for going on eight years now, uh, I can tell you on those real dusty days in the springtime, uh, that's not my ideal time to work out. 
Aerosols are a secondary pollutant. Um, we've also seen some changes here. Uh, the use of chlorofluorocarbons has been uh, pretty dramatically reduced in in the U.S. Um, two studies looked at uh, the use of aerosols found no substantial changes in pulmonary function uh, in either healthy or asthmatic test subjects. So that's somewhat encouraging, but uh, we still know that this is a potential pollutant. Ozone is produced uh, the action of by in nature by the action of ultraviolet radiation and oxygen. Um, we know that exercise in ozone results in decreased exercise performance and this also tends to be an inflammatory agent so want to avoid that really don't know a whole lot about peroxyacetyl nitrate this is a new one in this version of the textbook um, this is a common constituent of smog that we see over our major cities um, no effect noted as yet with exercise some medical concerns here. If we've got an asthmatic athlete, then their sensitivity to these pollutants is probably going to be greater. Uh, the question is how much greater. Uh, SOB, shortness of breath, coughing, wheezing, fine particulates, and exercise may stimulate an asthma attack. So uh, during those times, we want to make sure that they are medicating appropriately and that their rescue inhaler is available. If they've got allergies, this can also be worsened by exercise in these pollutants. Just a couple others here, circadian dysrhythmia or jet lag. This is a sleep pattern disturbance because of changes in time zone. This is worse when we're traveling west to east. Um, when I was at UTEP, we went to Hawaii for a football game and traveling from east to west was like, uh, it was like the clock didn't even move. It felt like we got bonus hours. Um, it's just like when you move the clock back uh, in the in the fall, it, it feels like, wow, you know, I've, I, I got an extra hour to sleep, or in that circumstance it was an extra two or three. Uh, but when you're traveling west to east, it's like the spring ahead. It's like, where did those hours go? Now suddenly I have to get up when yesterday I was in bed at this time. So the, the symptoms here, fatigue and headache, insomnia, blurred vision, our body's internal clock that's telling us when it's time to sleep and when it's time to be awake are not in sync with uh, the actual clock on the wall. Ways to minimize this, we want to depart well rested. Um, hydration is going to be key to when traveling west, consume caffeine. Uh, avoid caffeine when traveling east. Uh, reset the watch as soon as you're getting ready to board the plane, actually, and then avoid alcohol. Old school turf, um, some problems with it are abrasion. When I say old school turf, the real short, tufted, fast play, quote unquote, astro turf. This is a high friction surface, so problems with it are that it retains heat and it also leads to an increased risk of ankle and knee injuries. Now the artificial grass that's more more popular today, it does play more like grass, but a couple of problems with it. It does retain heat. Uh, most use a chopped up tire black rubber particulate infill. So the black rubber retains heat and then also that particulate infill gets everywhere so if you've got an abrasion it's got rubber particles embedded in it um, you get it in your eyes if you wear contact lenses uh, you get that stuff uh, in the eye it can be very painful so just a couple of things to consider there all right so for this week there is a quiz one and a thread of discussion two um, if you're doing this for the online class, uh, if, if we're using this for a supplement, then uh, just pay attention to what I say in class as to what's due. That's it for now. I will see you soon.